What's up, y'all? It's a coach here, fun day back at it once again. Kicking it for you and for yours. And um, first of all, I'd like to give a shout out to my ancestors for giving me knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to do these things. And second of all, I'd like to give a shout out to y'all, the subscriber and the watcher, because the channel been growing on different channel, uh, different channels and stuff like that, for different places and stuff. And I'm truly blessed to be doing what I'm doing right about now. You know what I mean? You on for yours. And hopefully y'all learn something, you know what I'm saying, from the stuff that I've been read about and been spent through the channel. Now this right here is The Liberator. It's a magazine by Akari, by Mari Bokari, an uh, African cultural nationalist. And this is their magazine called The Liberator. As you see, this is July issue, 1964. You know, see it right here, you know what I'm saying? And this is my exclusive. We are all brothers, blood brothers by Malcolm X. Malcolm is still alive. Bakari Bakari. Amari Bakari, you know, was friends with Malcolm X. Economics of Black Nationals of my hero crews, which we're gonna get into in this video, you know, part one. James Baldwin, the Henry Negro, you know. And then Nathan he was gold. So it was a magazine back in the day, funded by black people for black culture and nationalism. You know, and it's called The Liberator. It'll be coming out of July, ish to the issue of July 1964. Now, as I stated before, here is um, about your carries. There was this by, written, article written by Hero Hugh Cruz, which is a, um, a black man that really don't get much credit for the time being in the history, but you know. He does a lot of good work for the NLACP, not for the Crisis Magazine, which is NLACP. He's a damn good writer. I really don't get as much credit as he should. <clears throat> now let's go on to it with no more stuff. Let's get into this. The Economics of Black Nationalism, part one of three. The great conflict between W.E. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey in the early 20s had his root in the early leadership rivalry between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington that had agitated Negro leadership circles from the tone of the century until 1915 when Washington died. The basic underlying issues that gave rise to this Washington Du Bois Garvey conundrum was fundamentally economically, although Negro historians do not tell the story this way. The historians, both Negro and white, have so distorted and confused the issues involving Washington, Du Bois, and Garvey, that it's impossible for the present generation to comprehend the real meaning of these roles the leaders played. There was deep conflicts between Du Bois, first with Washington, and then with Garvey. But in reality, these conflicts were more concerned with leadership tactics than the certain racial principles that involved such goals as civil rights, racial equality, higher education, voting rights, gradualism, accommodationism, political power, back to Africa, separatism, integration, nationalism, etc., etc. In an attempt to explain the conflicts between Du Bois and his rivals, historians have done the Negro a serious disservice by elaborating on the slogans and ideologies of these leaders without carefully explaining the fundamental economic compulsions behind these ideologies. For neither Washington, nor Du Bois, nor Garvey can be understood in their proper context unless one, at the same time, apprehends the basic economic realities and motivations behind Negro class ideologies at any given time. For a while, it is true that the ideologies move men. It is economics that feed, clothes, and shelter them. Hence, if ideologies are understood in terms of economics, then these ideologies cannot be understood at all. Individual leaders can project ideologies of many kinds and colors them with many with the hues of their own personal aspirations, which very often obscure the very fundamental issues which are crucial to the interests of the people to whom the leaders speak. Then the historians come along and completely forget or overlook what the basic issues were for the people and the masses and their central attention on the personal characteristics of the leaders. In this fashion was the fundamental economic question that first split the voice in Washington 
and then Du Bois and Garvey. Almost completely lost in the historical account of these men, because both the historian and the partisan followers of these leaders, Washington, Du Bois, and Garvey, will have you believe that these three leaders represented three clearly defined separate schools of racial thought concerning the Negro in America. But for all these seeming differences, and they were very marked at certain times, these differences were essentially tactics, tactical rather than substantive. This can be shown by the fact that Du Bois wound up essentially agreeing with both Washington and Garvey on the necessity of a black economy, which was Washington's original idea. And then onto the back to Africa possibility, which Garvey main platform, which in turn was a further elaboration of the black economic theme. In his autobiography, Thus the Dawn, 1940, W. E. D. Du Bois protested against the charge that he had any serious differences with Washington. He stated that he was not against Washington's ideas, but insisted on the rights of other Negroes to express their ideas. But Du Bois admitted in his book that Washington was the undisputed of leaders of 10 million Negroes out of his time. If so, who were these other Negroes and what were their views on Negro leadership? Du Bois admitted of himself, I was not a natural leader of man. But then he argued that the question was so far, the question was as to how far educated Negro and opinion in the U.S. was going to have to rights and the opportunity to guide the Negro group. Hence, we see the seeds of W. Du Bois, kind of did tenth elite leadership concept. In other words, Du Bois' conflict with Washington was a leadership power struggle expressed mainly through the differences of theories of Negro education. Du Bois, being a Northern-born product of Fisk, Harvard, and Berlin universities, would naturally have a much different point of view on the education of Negro than Washington, a Southern product of slave parentage. But Du Bois had 37 years before the dusk of dawn was published, stated much more clearly in the real basis of his opposition to Washington and disputed leadership. In his Souls of Black Folks, 1903, he signed to his view on Washington as more thoroughly in his essay of Mr. Washington and others. The one analysis this essay, very thoroughly and very objectively, without partisan emotions and common to most Negroes these days, one can arrive at a clear comprehension of what the Negro problem is all about and also better understand what is wrong with the Negro movement today, and why this movement is hung up in a problematic crisis. Booker T. Washington has stated in his position in 1865, with his famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, Atlanta Exposition speech. The boys, the boys quoted him, in all things purely social, we can be as separate as five fingers, yet as one as a hand, and all things essential to mutual progress. This went down in Negro history as Washington Atlanta Compromise, which according to Du Bois and others, mostly from a safer Northern states, as well as civil rights, sell out Washington's soft-spoken paddle civil rights agitation in the South, was interpreted as a counseling of Negro submission. And so it may seem, as we were looking at the South of 1895 to 1910, and the mistake that the South was the South today, Du Bois' attitude was, Mr. Washington Council of Submission overlooked certain elements of true manhood and his educational program was unnecessarily narrow. Notice the reference of the educational theory. However, Du Bois had to recognize that these circumstances had to elevate Washington to the ranks of one of the most recognized spokesmen of his 10 million followers and that one of the most noble figures in his nation of 70 million. Therefore, Du Bois softened his criticism on Washington by saying, one hesitates, therefore, to criticize a life which, beginning with so little, has done so much. Then Du Bois continued what is the essence of his conflict with Washington leadership. This is an age of unusual economic development, and Mr. Washington program naturally takes on an economic cast, becoming a gospel of work and money to such an extent as apparently almost completely to overshadow the higher aims of life, underscoring ours. Hence the question of economics, the real underlying social 
forces his way into the picture. The voice then elaborates on this economic theme as follows. Mr. Washington is strongly known to be to make a Negro artisans, businessmen, and property owners, but it's utterly impossible under modern competitive, competitive methods for working men and property owners to defend their rights and exist without the right of suffrage. Washington's views on suffrage were expressed as follows. Brains, property, and character for the Negro will settle the question of civil rights. The best course to pursue in regards to an active civil rights bill in the South is to let it alone. Let it alone and it will settle itself. Good schools, good schools, teachers, and plenty of money to pay them will be more important than selling the race questions in many civil rights bills and investigation committees. The boy has countered this by voicing the sentiments of his own and that the other class of Negroes who cannot agree with Mr. Washington. He said, such men feel in conscious to ask, such, ask this nation three things. One, the right to vote. Two, civil equality. Three, education of the youth according to ability. This reference of education of youth to according to ability was a reflection of Du Bois, Washington Du Bois disagreement over education theories. Washington favored a common school and industrial trainings for Negroes in the South. And according to Du Bois, he appreciated institutions of higher learnings, which implied that for most Negroes in the South, what Washington was teaching at Tuskegee was not higher learning. Here again, Du Bois' educational elitism and talented him ideas were conflicted with Washington's functional or practical education ideas as concerned with the masses of illiterate or semi-literate Negroes who have fitted into the industrial society. Washington did not see what the study of French, Latin, and Greek had to do in enabling a class of Negroes he was most concerned with was to earn a practical living. This educational controversy is still no longer, is, is no longer valid today, but it is noteworthy that Carter G. Woodson in his book, this education of Negro apparently favored Washington's school of thought and does not mention the boys anywhere in his study. Why Woodson observed that the large majority of Negroes who are put on the finishing touches of our best colleges are all but worthless in development of their people. He speaks of contempt for the Negroes as part of the educated Negroes and added, Negro scholars taught in universities outside the South. Languages, mathematics, and science may serve well, but what has been taught in economics, history, literature, religion, philosophy is propaganda and cannot and can end a waste of time and has misdirected the Negroes thus trained. This was without a doubt a slap at the boys' tongue attempt idea. Woodson added, that the classical education produced no Negro thinkers or philosophers. Woodson did not agree or disagree with Washington's industrial education theory and principle, but it observed that it resulted in no uplift of Negroes as artisans and mechanics because of the lack of facilities, obsolete methods, and techniques that did not equip the Negroes to keep up with the rapid changes in industrial techniques based on the division of labor. As well to be expected, the inevitable economics of race question found its way into Woods' remarks. He observed that in schools of business administration, Negroes are trained exclusively in psychology of and the economics of Wall Street, and are therefore made to despise the opportunities to run ice wagons, push banana carts among their own people. Foreigners who have not studied economics, but have studied the Negro, take up businesses and grow rich. From all of this, it must be seen that Washington Du Bois controversy over race leadership and politics are fundamentally economic, but fought off in the terms of rivalry over educational theories. Mainly because Washington School of Thought was getting a lion's share of white philanthropy for Negro education. Hence, Washington had more pull with the big white folks than Du Bois. But Washington's position in all of this forced him to soft paddle civil rights and politics to placate Southern white opinion in order to further his own economic platform, which he considered more important than civil rights. 
the latter, he felt, could not be one of the southern conditions at the time. But the voice said, as we shall see later, did not really disagree with Washington over economics, but had to force Washington's hand on civil rights by, one, the right to vote, two, civic equality, three, our education as a civil rights program. This, the Bois position on the civil rights soon flowered into the Niagara movement. A protest group opposed a very small group of article critics of Washington. This dissident group soon was absorbed by white liberals and a sort of socialist to form the NAACP. Thus, it was that the official civil rights protest movement was forever separated from the basic economics of the Negro situation in America as first posted by Booker T. Washington and given an organizational form and a National Negro Business League established by him in 1900. This business league still exists in Washington, D.C. But at the time that the proven issues of the first raised by Washington and the West are still very much with us, neither the civil rights of the Boys nor the economics of Washington have won their full measure of acceptance in an educational problem on another level is more a born, a bone, a civil contention among the races than ever before. Moreover, even the voice educational elitism was given a critical downgrading by Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week and the Association of Negro History Week and the Association of the Study of Negro Life and History. The fundamentals of all issues growing out of the original clash between Washington and the boys is the central fact that he has still not resolved the Negro thinking. It is impossible to separate civil rights of economics of the problem of the Negro existence in America by the civil rights of in economics. We simply do not mean the questions of jobs, discrimination, and employment. The question is much deeper than this. This is brought home to Du Bois, who more profoundly several years after his conflict with Washington when the Garvey movement came in tune for being. But Garvey, even before he came to America, had been a student of Booker T. Washington's economics, which Du Bois had already said grew out of an age of unusual economic development. This is an important observation on the part of Du Bois, where it was assumed that too many people of various political aspirations, both Negro and white, that is there, something very strange that the Negroes won't develop a capitalist class or that is even necessary in the terms of capitalist development, that should a class come about, come into existence or even elsewhere or thrive to cultivate a capitalist bourgeoisie ideology. Even through a real capitalist class well entrenched in the corporate structure of American capitalism is never achieved. This has been a unique problem for the American Negro. We have cultivated among us a strong bourgeois outlook among our articulated and educated classes. But this bourgeois mentality has not matched and by any parallel or achievement as capitalist producers, entrepreneurs, arts managers. Hence, this bourgeois mentality becomes in many ways troublesome intellectual abnormality in many Negroes. These bourgeois trappers are worn like an expensive but ill-fitting clothing by people who harbor exaggerated bourgeois ideas, but lack of substance to back up these ideas. It would not be half as bad if these bourgeois ideas were out of a profound knowledge of economic thought, which the public libraries are full of. But our own bourgeois oriented Negroes are economic wise, the most illiterate clip from all people. They clutter up the Negro civil rights movement with their straight straight in protests and really believe that American capitalism is gonna grant them racial equality while they remain in the blinding ignorance of the inner workings of American capitalism. These Negroes have kept in ignorance about capitalist realities, and not only about themselves, by their white liberals and radical and revolutionary friends from the left of center to the left. The liberals have promised them full integration without economic integration above. The level of token jobs, which is a lie. The white leftists have advised them to forget about capitalist economy of the marketplace today and place their hopes upon a socialist tomorrow, which is a dishonest deception. It took the waste almost a lifetime to see through the first lie of white liberals concerning the civil rights. Washington saw through the tale by pure common sense reasoning. 
But then Du Bois had much longer to live in Washington and had a much broader life of canvas to paint on and more horizons to conquer. Right after Washington died, Harry came on the scene. Hence, Washington's original black economy theories took on a broader implication than he gave it in 1900. From now on, the black economy theory was pushed into the international scene and had included the continent of Africa and the American Negroes in relationship to that continent. And that's where we stop at part one. Now, that makes some good points. You know what I'm saying, Harold Cruz, and dealing with it all came back down to economics of black nationalism. You know, and as we got to the later half of the other, other paper, which is pretty damn good, that these niggas have kept the ignorance about economic realities, not only by themselves, but by their white liberal and radical and revolutionary friends from the left of center to the left. The liberals have promised them full integration without economic integration above. The level of token jobs which is given a lie, which is a lie. The white leftists have advised them to forget about capitalist economics of the marketplace today and place their hopes on socialism tomorrow, which is a dishonest deception. And if you see this now, in 2019, this is the same stuff that's being pushed now. You know what I'm saying? And still to today, and nothing much has changed because of this stagnation of thought in the moment of a black bourgeoisie class that's propped up by white liberals. And you know, or, or AKA a town of the 10th, you know what I'm saying? And then they're gonna get the same job and stuff like that. And we'll do with any rate, but the white liberals control them still. So they can only reach it, they have their own, they, they formulated their own glass ceiling by shaking hands with these people. He said Du Bois, he said that um, what you call it, Washington, George Washington, excuse me, Booker T. Washington, he knew about that by common sense. You know what I'm saying? He knew that was just common sense, that wasn't gonna happen. And it seemed like we got it caught in that illusion of, of losing that common sense of Booker T. Washington had saying that wasn't gonna happen. You know, he said that civil rights in the South in this area was not gonna happen like that. So instead of worrying about that, let's get our money together and stack our chips up. You know, which is kind of hard for a lot of people to see, which is understandable, because people want to do their thing. Another point of be on this one was that um, Negroes wanted to develop a capitalist class, which is true. You read old school books on um, Reconstruction, that's what we wanted. Even before the Civil War popped up, we knew we built America. You know, we knew what we was doing and built America, Negro, slave, or free. You know what I'm saying? Or even if it was necessary with the terms of capitalist development, that such a class comes into existence or else strive to cultivate a capitalist bourgeoisie ideology, even though a real capitalist class, well entrenched in corporate American production of a capitalist America can never be achieved. This is a unique problem for the American Negro. So even with this capitalist class, it was never gonna really achieve and get on the same equal power as white America. You feel me? We have cultivated among us a strong bourgeoisie outlook among the articulate and educated classes. But this bourgeoisie mentality is not matched by any parallel of the achievements as the capitalist producers and entrepreneurs or managers. Hence, this bourgeoisie mentality becomes in many ways a trouble intellectual abnormality, abnormality in many Negroes. You know what I'm saying? So even when you become this bourgeoisie capitalist, Negro bourgeoisie capitalist, you're never gonna fit in the mold of the white capitalists of their society. You know. Things is about out of common sense. You know what I'm saying? Because they're not gonna let you break into the national market today. They break their nation building up. But through that, you can build your own nation, not playing sick or fiddle, but build your own nation and make services strong. You know, it all comes back down to economics. Anywho, this is a Koski of Funday. Like I said before, this is part way of um, part one of the economics of black nationalism by Harold Cruz. And we're gonna get into part two. Soon, real, real soon. Much love to y'all. Subscribe to the channel. Peace.